Hello, everybody. So excited to have my good friend, Brett Wetzel. Did I say it right? What? I, always, yep. I just always call you Brett. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> super excited to have Brett here. Uh, we talk all the time. I love the conversations. I learn so much from Brett, and he gets to work on some of the really cool stuff. One day, I'm just going to go and ride around with him. Just hang out and just like carry his tools because he does such cool stuff. As always, somebody I've admired. I really appreciate our friendship. And uh, today, I think uh, Brett, you want to talk about some education, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, er, you know, everyone typically knows me for the, you know, for the for being a co-host on the podcast, you know, for advanced for duration. But I, I don't really get the the chance to really talk about. Like I talk about my week occasionally, but I don't really talk about really what I do. You know what I mean? So it was funny. Like you know, the reason why I say that is because. You know, my daughter the other day, I, I said to her, I was like, hey, daddy's got to go out of town. Um, why do you got to go out of town? I was like, well, because I, I have to teach a class. You're a teacher? I'm like, what, what do you think I do? She's like, you fix refrigerators. I'm like, yes. You know, like supermarket stuff, yes. But she's like, but you teach. So you're like Miss Andrews, like like Jake's teacher? I'm like. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> so, like, you know, I was like, what did you think I did? She's like, I thought you just podcasted for a living. I was like, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> so, um, but, yeah, so I, I, I'm actually, my title is Manager of Technical Troubleshooting and Training over at uh, Coolsys. Um, we have probably 88 branches uh, all over all over the country. Um We have uh, probably about, you know, 2,000 north or 2,000 technicians. And I fortunately have been uh, now in charge of all the training. So coming up with curriculum, um, you know, we've, you know, Coolsys used to be a uh, source um, and source was a very big commercial industrial, um, you know, uh, uh, company. Right. So, you know, we uh, we've acquired uh, different companies throughout, you know, throughout the, the life of Coolsys. I've been here. November will be eight years for me. And, um, you know, we have. Um, we now have people that work on just HVAC. We have people that work on, you know, like commercial stuff. So now we have to curtail our education programs to exactly that. You know, we have to we have to evolve. We can't stay the same as what we were. So I'm I'm working diligently with our development team trying to uh, develop a light commercial uh, curriculum. I mean, we have you know for the most part we you know our stuff does cover light commercial, but it's it's more concentric to racks. Like so you have. We, we do a little bit of HVAC, a little bit of commercial, but most of the stuff that, that has been in the training has been, you know, the, the supermarkets and the, you know, cold, you know, uh, light cold storage facilities. Um, so, like I said, so we're, we're creating curriculum around the light commercial sector so we can uh, make sure that those technicians as well, you know, are, have every bit of the, the education uh, possibilities, you know, that, that we can. Uh, some of the curriculum that involves in some of the courses like commercial stuff or CLC as we refer to is going to be, you know, obviously, you know, regular how to set up your gauges, you know, vacuum pump recovery, you know, stuff like that. But then going into, you know, smaller refrigeration, uh, into walk-ins, uh, we have a little bit of boiler information in there because there's some people that do have to deal with it, especially on some of the hot side stuff. Um, we also, I, I'm very heavy in trying to get VRF uh, into our facility. I'm actually, I've, I've been spending a lot of time in Houston uh, trying to get the training center. So the training center has you know, one rooftop unit, you know, uh, one air conditioning unit and, you know, a whole bunch of rack stuff. Right. So now I'm adding two or three ice machines. I'm adding, you know, three more rooftop units. I'm going to have a bunch of tables that are going to have mini split condensing units and evaporators set up so they can be rolled around, plugged in. And then you can do training on that. Um, working with some manufacturers, uh, getting some uh, equipment so we can do VRF, you know, so it'll be, you know, two pipe and three pipe. So you'll have, you know, the regular uh, heat recovery where, you know, it can take that liquid and, and just run it through the coil to get a little bit of heat in there. And then we'll also uh, have the type of system where it's a three pipe system where you basically have discharge gas and, and, and liquid and suction. So it can run, you know, this evaporate over here can run heat the same time that this this one's running cooling. So I'm really excited about everything that we got going on. Um, currently, we have four training centers. We have one in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we have one in uh, uh, Menemone Falls, Wisconsin, and we have another one in Houston, Texas, and the other one in Fullerton, California. Um, we have some plans, uh, that future plans that, that we'll get into next time we talk. Um, you know, but you know, education is really important because, as you know, 
there are net technicians falling out of the sky, right? You know, it's 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 feast or famine. It's it's you know, we have this technician. Well, uh, put him in a truck, see what happens. You know what I mean? Like that. You know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the and I and I'm not knocking all the trade schools because uh, a lot of them are really good, but the lot a lot of them are profit centers, right? We're just going to get this guy through, call him certified and, and, and knock him out. And then you have to, you know, the, the company that, that that person ends up working for usually has to invest at least six months of time trying to get him enveloped in, in, in what his day to day and what his job is. Right. So, and you know, anything that we can do to, to make that better, um, we're going to do that. Right. And that's the, you know, that, that's my mark. I, you know, I want to be able to change, uh, training as a whole for the country. Uh, you know, I, I want to leave my mark and I have plans that I think that we're going to do that's going to end up, you know, being able to do that. And we're going to be one of the leaders. Um, you know, like I said, we, uh, we invested in a uh, CO2 transcritical trainer this year. Um, we're in the process of potentially buying another one because, you know, why not have one, but also have two. So we'll have one in California and we'll have one in, in, in Houston, Texas. So when I get it, it should be coming September. You know, I, I'm, I'm expecting a visit from my good friend, Ty, to come down and check it out. Absolutely. <laughs> the CO2 stuff, I I don't have any experience with CO2. I've taken the classes. I've even insisted teaching some classes on it. I've got to see the Dan Fossman, which is awesome. I got to see our uh, the Emerson one, uh, now Copeland one, you know, which is super cool. But, you know, I haven't actually got to play with it. And that's uh, that's so cool to see that it's not just this idea that's out there anymore. It's not just something that's in Europe. It's here. It's now. It's actually in use. And super, it's, it's a real thing. And, uh, and education is so far behind. Like, I would be scared to death to go and just work with even with all the training. I'm scared to death working on it. So having something there where people can practice on it, get used to it, even, you know, seeing the basics hands on with somebody there is, I mean, that's a huge deal. For sure. And you know what? I'll tell you, I'll tell you a secret and it's not going to be secret anymore. So Kevin always gives me shit about, oh, you know, you just, you read about CO2 and you barely worked on it. And he's right. I mean, I like, I've, I've worked on systems. I've helped diagnose stuff, you know, all across the board. I've never done a CO2 startup. So last week when I was in Arizona, that was my first CO2 startup. They, they basically was like, we're, 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 we're having some issues with it. We'd like to like you to help, you know, help assist. And he's like, can, can you get on a plane and do it? I'm like, yeah, sure. I, you know, whatever. Because, I mean, quite honestly, I mean, CO2 sounds scary um, because the higher pressures, right? They're like, oh, 15, you know, 1500 pounds. That's that's insane. Well, OK, yeah, yeah, exactly. But like everything is DX. It's it's still the same process. We're still having superheat. We're still have subcooling. Um, the only thing finicky about like the whole CO2 thing is is the whole control for the for what they call is the hpv or high pressure valve or high pressure expansion valve uh and and the flash tank like that whole premise is the only real thing that's really different like there are some little nuances like so we all know that you know minimum amount of superheat for any hfc or hfo compressor minimum at 20 degrees right that's usually hey we're as long as we're there we're fine well with co2 or the problem is, is, is the oil uh, and CO2 are very miscible with each, with each other. So when you run a lower superheat, like in the 15 range, um, you're going to start carrying over more oil than what you typically would. Um, and that's not good. All you know, right. It's not made for that. So we have to make sure that we have a higher superheat coming back. And that's one of the reasons why on a lot of these racks, there is a ton of control. Like, and so like you'll have a heat exchanger that's on, let's just say the drain leg of your gas cooler basically the line coming out of the gas cooler condenser it's it's called a gas cooler because after 87 degrees it doesn't really condense that's why they just call it gas cooler but right there a lot of times they'll have a heat exchanger and that heat exchanger they'll use on the low temp suction so before the suction coming back from the system it will make a pit stop in a heat exchanger over just to superheat that line to ensure that we don't have any liquid coming back to compressors because of the point where i said where oil is very you know, uh, miscible with, with, uh, with CO2 and caused a lot of carryover. And what's crazy is when I, when I was first learning about it, people said, well, that'll never be in the States. It's too dangerous. It's too high. And then, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And then if you go back in time, we, we like to make old things new again. They were using CO2 on ships, you know, way long ago. So it's, it's not a new thing. It's just new to us. And there's so many things in refrigeration that same way. We talk about flammable refrigerants. Well, flammable refrigerants were used a long time ago. 
And, you know, then we got into these, you know, safe refrigerants and which also is flammable. And then we end up uh, getting right back to, you know, mildly flammable, flammable refrigerants. So the key, I think, to all of it is is learning, not being afraid of it, respecting it, but not being afraid of it, learning and just doing it, you know, getting out there, getting getting into it. So many people I find they learn something and then they don't want to learn anything else. Like, well, I learned that that's enough. And with anything you do, things are changing. And what I've learned from some people I really respected, I found was was wrong. I still love and respect the people, but I learned that some of the things they've told me are wrong. I've learned that when I taught things in school, some of the things I taught was wrong. And I feel horrible about that. You know, you learn though when you adapt. Mm -hmm. I used to teach that everything needed start kits. Oh yeah, just put a hard start kit on everything. And I learned later that's wrong with scrolls specifically. You know, so it's a big part of it, you know, is that that learning. And that's one of the things I love about teaching. I love teaching because I'm out there not just fixing equipment, but I'm able to help change people's lives and make their job easier and make a change in industry. But even beyond that, when I teach, I learn more than I than I teach because you have to understand it to a deeper level. You have to be willing to answer people's questions and, and they'll challenge you. And I love that when a student's like, yeah, but what about this or what about that? And then I have to go and research and learn about it or go get experience on it. And, um, and it's cool. We got some really awesome people here in the chat today. That's awesome. Thanks, everybody, for uh, for tuning in. Absolutely. Well, one of the things I want to say, like some, you know, I, I used to just teach, you know, what I thought they needed to know. And then as I like started teaching longer and longer, I then realized there are things that I do that saved me a shit ton of time that I never think to share. So like this prime example. So I, I, I know I don't have those days. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that I taught that I started teaching people when I when I teach is, you know, a, doing pressure controls, right? You know, what, what, what do we typically do? If we have a low pressure switch that's bad, what do we do? We hook up the low pressure switch and we pump that thing down 60 freaking times in order to get it, you know, to get it to pump down right at the right pressures, right? So what I had started teaching people is, you know, instead of wasting 30 or 40 minutes trying to pump that thing down is basically, you know, uh, set the pressure switch with your digital gauges, a, a multimeter and a, a bottle of nitrogen. And then that way you have a set precise um, pressure, like if you know it's supposed to cut out at, you know, 20 degrees saturated, you know, to maintain the 30 degree box, well, then that's what you're going to do. You're going to set it to whatever that is. But just something like that, um, I had told people in their minds, just like, oh my God, I didn't know that. that, that that's, you know, because they know how much time they waste. Same thing with a fan cycling switch, right? You try to set a fan cycling switch, what are you doing? You're manipulating the fan, you know, pulling the, pulling the power off the fan, putting it back on just to make that pressure switch make and break. So, I mean, quite honestly, it just some of those little things that you catch in the field that makes you more efficient is going to help a bunch of other people. And that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted this role. Like, I, I honestly I was thinking about leaving at one point, um, you know, a couple years ago because I was I was bored. I wasn't and I felt like I, I could reach more people and help more people if I if I had more of a more of a role in that. And, and so that's what they did. They're like, well we're going to give you that role and then you can reach more people. I'm like, well, that's awesome. So like now, you know, we're, you know, I, I worked out of Dallas, right. And then we, we had 13 technicians. I got that up to about 53. Uh, then I started doing regional training all over Oklahoma and Texas and all over the place, all the way down to like Corpus Christi and Rio Grande Valley down by Adrian there at reliable. Um, and it was awesome. But you know, then they were like, well, what would you, would you really dig like, doing it for the whole country. And I'm like, yes, because then I'm never bored. I always got a puzzle to fix. There's always something awesome. You know what I mean? Like the, 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 I love puzzles and it, it, you know, as you know, I know you know this for a fact, but you enjoy what you do. You legitimately enjoy teaching. You legitimately love this freaking trade. And I feel the same way. Like I, I like that, that corny saying was like, well, well, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's, I, it sounds corny as shit, but it, it's true. Like, I really, really enjoy what the hell I do. Um, I, I just, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy being able to see the light bulb go on when, when you're explaining something and you can see someone struggling, then all of a sudden there's that, that the eyes like open up, like you just, like you're about to hit a wall and you're like, oh shit, I, I get it now. I get it. And, that, and that's, I, I love that. I love the fact that I, I, you know, that I was able to do that with, you know, many people and, and have a broader reach. And that was Honestly, that was one of the reasons for starting the podcast. You know, we uh, three o'clock in the morning or three thirty, whenever it was, because I don't sleep well. I'm up just, you know, looking on YouTube, and I was like, man, someone's gonna get hurt 
like someone's going to die. There was so much bad information, like like you said, right? I mean, you know, people are sharing things that they're doing. They might not be doing it the best way. Like, look at any video of people brazing. How many people brazing do you actually see wear safety glasses? Next time you're next time you're looking through them, like he's he's showing off that he's brazing good. I'm like, that's awesome. But what happens if that shit goes in your eye? You know. Yep. So I was working with uh, Craig Michelaccio last week, and uh, we were doing some things, and we were putting gauges on. And he looked at me and says, well, where are your gloves at? And I was like, you know, I've been doing this since 1995. I don't wear gloves when I'm putting it. He goes, but today you're going to because you're going to set a good example. I'm like, you know what? Today is a great day. And so he had these really cool latex gloves that, you know, didn't absorb liquid refrigerant. And, it, you know, mm-hmm. I was like, well, in my day, we had the gloves that would absorb that liquid. So you didn't want to wear them because it's more dangerous. But so you know, you're today we have an end glove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So with these gloves we had, on, I was like, you know, this is cool. And so. Just last week, I started wearing gloves while putting uh, gauges on and off. And so, yeah, we're, we're never too old to continue to learn. And I was super blessed to be uh, understudy for Don Gillis over at um, Emerson and Copeland. And mm-hmm. I learned so many things with him. And if I would say something wrong or not fully correct, he'd say, well, you know, that's one way to look at it. But if we look at what the manufacturer says, we look at the facts, you know, it's just so smooth the way he'd be like, hey, you know, I, I get that. But he was just so good at, at changing it to being like a. Let's bring you some a new level. Let's bring you some new level. And I learned so much from working under him. It was uh, it was really incredible. Gotcha. No, man. Like, um, so I mean, prime example. So, like, a lot of people, you know, this is tribal knowledge, right? If you ever have a line break, or if you're setting up gauges and it's just leaking out aggressively, you just walk away. You walk away. You assess the situation and see if there's any way that you can slow it safely, right? So, I'm doing this startup last week. And I'm adding, I'm adding CO2. So we have a manifold that has six, it's a stainless steel manifold, you know, all, uh, you know, uh, uh, pressure, uh, pressure rated hoses. And before I get started, the guy that I'm working with, James, he's like, these hoses right here came from so-and-so. He's like, be careful. That nut is really brittle. It's very fragile. So just make sure you don't over tighten. I'm like, okay. So I'm, I'm being real ginger with it. And I like I'm back blowing vapor. So I opened up, opened up just to get vapor in there because you with CO2, you have to make sure you get vapor in there first when you're pressurizing, because if you try to charge it with straight liquid, if it's under, you know, 67 PSI, it's going to turn into into dry ice. Right. So we have to pressurize the manifold with with with, uh, you know, vapor first. So I'm doing that and I shut it off. And then literally so I have like probably, you know, 500 pounds of 500 PSI of vapor in this, in this thing. And I'm back blowing it and then tightening it down, back blowing, tightening it down. And I get to the last one and I'm like, wow, it's leaking a little bit. So I just, it's just a little bit. And all of a sudden <laughs> all over the place. And I, I back up and I have my safety glasses on and I'm looking over uh, where James is. And I see him staring at me like, what the hell did you just do? Yeah. And then, so he, uh, <laughs> so he looks over at me and I, I, I step back from him because I want to make sure I didn't get whipped in the face while, you know, just assessing the situation. It whipped over here. So I grabbed the bottle and turned it off because I only have it, you know, just opened up just a little bit. So I, you know, in, in case something like that happens, I can shut off in a rush. And he comes over. I was like, I knew you were going to come over. <laughs> and so now it's going to become a necklace. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, I was talking to a guy that had ammonia on his fishing boat and uh, how they froze everything. And he said he had this connection. And he goes, you know what? I feel like I should just valve this off first. But it just blew. he grabbed his wrench over there and he thought, maybe I should valve this off. He goes, no, nah, so he just gave it a little bit of a tight and it just blew everything. It just started blowing. So he runs out and he calls back to the, the station, the dock, whatever it's called. I don't, I don't, I'm not a Marine guy, if you hadn't noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and they said, oh, no, we got to get a hazmat team there. You know, they'll be there within 24 hours. And he's like, are you kidding me? I, I can't wait that long. So he tries to go back in. And he goes, oh, yeah, it was burning my skin. And, like, I feel like bees were stinging me. And I'm like, what? Like, I couldn't imagine to be that tough to even think that. You know, uh, I don't know if tough's the right word. But anyways, he said, yeah, he went back and got this fire suit, went on and actually got the valves closed and was able to save it. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm I'm not a great example of a safety person, but I'm like, wow like that was just you know boggled my mind and you know here he has to live to tell it because i'm telling you if you have a chance to close the valve do it i'm telling you that i learned the hard way it's so much better to learn from other people's stories right you know could you imagine having an ammonia of all things you know i wanted to tell him yeah that wasn't bee stings that was your skin you know your flesh being rotten eaten away well that's the thing with with anhydrous ammonia like it it, it wants to absorb moisture 
right? Um, so not only do you get the you know the freezer burn from the liquid, but you also get the, it wanting to attack moisture. So if you don't know, when I did ammonia refrigeration for about five years, and what you would do is you know when you were pumping down a system, you obviously you pump all the liquid out. And then once you pump all the liquid out, you uh, you know you just have the vapor left, so you're going to pump it down to whatever you can. But I mean, this is a big central system that could have a 15 inch or a 16 inch pipe. You know what I mean? It's a lot of suction gas to pull back, so you're not going to pump it all the way down. So at that point, it's a natural refrigerant. You put the vapor uh, off of wherever you're pulling it, put it in a hose, and put it in a five gallon bucket of water. And so the water neutralizes the anhydrous ammonia. The thing is with that, when you're doing it, if you do it really fast, the anhydrous ammonia starts to heat up. It starts, the water will just sit there at room temperature and just start to boil. Um, because, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So the, the, there's a, I have a couple of pictures, I'll show you off air, but um, some coils fell down from a facility. I was, I was, you know, I wasn't, the, excuse me, there at the time, but the, literally all this piping evaporators, the steel didn't break, it just bent and just pulled everything down. And you see a, a hose coming off the evaporator, just going into a five gallon bucket with a little rigid wrench on there, just holding it on. There was a question in the chat. Um, the guy, one of the guys was asking, uh, what kind of gloves? Like, I know you said liquid gloves when you were talking, when you were with Craig. Yeah, so I think the official answer is like an EPA or OSHA big long list of something I've never been able to find. But he had these just, I think it was um, a nit nitrogen latex something. I don't know. It was a black glove. It was like uh, you were, when you're working in a car just to keep the grease and stuff off of you. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we went, they were nice and thick. They didn't make your hands feel awkward. It was um, it was pretty cool. So I don't, I don't know what type it was. Uh, it had two names on it. I don't know if you know yeah. what I'm talking about. But yeah, no, I, uh, I that's what I tried. That's what he had me use. And uh, it worked well, I thought. Uh, one of the first, time, the first times that uh, that I was, uh, what should we call it? Um, try, uh, work, working on ammonia that, you know, when I that, for that time in my life, I never had a beard because you always had to be ready for the hazmat. You know what I mean? So if if God forbid you have a leak and, you know, the fire department's going to come, hazmat's going to come. Yes. But uh, if you're going to go in there, uh, you, you need to suit up. And so in hazmat training, uh, they have this big tanker of anhydrous ammonia and everyone's suited up and they basically just open up a valve. And that's to get you comfortable with going towards danger, right? Going towards the anhydrous ammonia. Um, and it, it's, it's a scary freaking thing, but I mean, you know, it's, it's like anything else, right? It's, you get comfortable with it. You, you know, you, you know what to do. It's, it's like a, a residential guy moving up to commercial and, or a commercial guy moving up to industrial, you know, it's just, it's, it's being comfortable around the equipment. And, you know, that's why education is so important. Right. Um, I learned a lesson when I, I, I make videos for CoolSys as well. So we also have a website that has every bit of data that I have. It's like 200 some gigs worth of information that's all searchable. But I also started making videos, um, you know, checking superheat, leak checking cases, you know, stuff like that, uh, changing a, a valve plate. And when I first started making the videos, I was super excited. I was super proud of myself. I did it all on my iPhone. This is before I bought any kind of equipment. And I started posting the shit on LinkedIn. I was like, yeah, videos are coming. I'm going to make videos. And then the safety guy calls me. He's like, hey, Brett, I think what you're doing is great. Just how about next time you have them wear some gloves or some glass? I'm like, shh. So from here on out, I, I, I you know, I know what to do. <laughs> That's the great part about learning, training, making videos is you, you get to really learn like these little things. Now, sometimes people are just out there, you know, being jerks. But a lot of times people are doing it, you know, out of, you know, wanting to help, you know, for example, wearing safety glasses. I get, I get hit on that one a lot just because, you know, I grew up, nobody wore safety glasses. And so, you know, trying to remember to wear it. My wife is really good at reminding me, Hey, put your safety glasses on. Cause I'm not going to read this stuff for you when you lose your eyes, you know, and it's uh, it is true. Cause I'm putting ceiling tiles up and I had safety glasses on. It's funny. Like my eyes didn't itch and burn like they normally do. It's like safety glasses were a great idea. You know, what about that? So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, that's a great part about learning and then, you know, habits doing stuff when, you see somebody online, they'll be brazing, they're not flowing nitrogen through, and somebody will, will immediately tag them. And I think that's, as long as we're not doing it to actually, you know, be spiteful or mean, you know, but that constant saying, hey, where's the nitrogen? I think that's a good thing overall. As long as we're not doing it to attack people, you know, I think it's a good thing to say, you know, let's, let's you know, work to be, nobody's perfect, but let's always work to be better. Or, you know, or, or the other thing, so look at anyone cleaning a coil. 
any 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 video that's out there of anyone ever cleaning a coil, and I'm willing to bet at least seventy five percent of them are all showing the wrong direction to blow you know to blow the dirt through. You know, like someone's like, oh yeah, cleaning coil is real good. And they're just p- compacting that dirt more into the coil. I'm like, what are you doing? Like that's, and no one's saying anything. And I'm like, I understand. Like they're not trying to, you know, no one's trying to be an asshole, right? So, but there's you got to split the coil, which is hard. Like I, I hate doing that. I have one of the first times I ever had to do that. Um, I I did the Joe Dirt thing, and I was like, oh, I could do this. And I went up there, and I started split the coil and I was like, wow, this thing's really being real tough. So what did I do? The smart guy, you know, oh, wait, let's just take a screwdriver to it and separate it. Oh, yeah. I went right through that U-bed and it starts spraying and I'm like, I'm new. I don't know what to do. So the guy called the guy that mentored me and I was like, Ed, Ed, what do I do? He's like, try to braise it. I was like, I don't my, my, I don't have a turbo torch. He's like, you're not going to use a turbo torch. You have to use oxy And I was like, I'm scared of it. He's like, just try it. And I started burning away U-bed. I was like, nope, you got to come. I'm going to fuck this coil all the way up. I was like, you just got to come out here and give me a hand. And it's, you know, it's like we said, it, it's, it's getting comfortable with that. Um, what are some of the things that you see, like, well, you know, with the newer, newer technicians coming out, you know, issues um, that you see uh, with, with, you know, going through education and going through trade schools and stuff like that. Oh, but that's a, that's a loaded question, Brett. Um, I think, we have two problems, uh, two big problems in education. One problem is a student thinks they're going to go to school and they're going to know everything they need to know. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's just not the case. Uh, on the other side, you have people that in the field think that somebody's going to come out of school knowing what they need to know. And so both of those are wrong. School doesn't teach you everything to be successful. It's about having tools. Ideally, I think somebody should be doing the work while they're learning. There's no way you can just the best of the best of the best schools, you just go through, you, you can learn the basic stuff, you can learn safety stuff, you can have some practice, you have some experience, which is great, but you need field experience. You need to be able to actually do it yourself, you know, hands-on in the field. Some of the things you just can't simulate everything in a lab. I think learning while you're doing it is great or having, you know, sessions to where, hey, we're going to teach you this much, go out and do that much, and then we'll take you to the next step, something along those lines, because I've had students that I thought, you know, I don't think this person's going to cut it. And then they end up being top notch students in the field because they got grit and they figure it out. And I've had other students that were just like their mind was great how they worked and they went through and they thought through things and they put them out in the field and you put them in the attic. And then it just, you know, they, they can't take it. Or, you know, you have different mindsets of employers. Somebody knows, does wants to do everything the right way. And they get an employer that says, no, just vent the charge. Oh, just beer can cold or, you know, all these bad habits. And they're so frustrated and they're so, you know, mad that they waste all this time and money and it's just, you know, a, it's not real to them or they're going to have to break laws. They get mad and leave. So to me, the education side needs to be as you learn, as you grow. So it needs to be with companies. And I've had schools that I've been able to really, I mean, change lives with people going through school. And I think it's to start, you need something, you know, you need some basics, like what Jennifer's doing. That's awesome. She's going out there and giving people those tools so they can get that first job and get started. But learning isn't a, hey, you did this, congratulations. It has to be an ongoing, nonstop process. I still learn every day. I pick up something new every single day. And I think that's one of the things that we miss. Just uh, today, I posted a video about compressors don't just die. They're murdered on TikTok. And I got tons, floods of comments. And we're like, nope, they just make them bad. And uh, this one guy, I was, you know, I'm trying to be educational and help people. This one guy's like, nope, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know they just break. And I was like, hey, look, let's sit down sometime and talk about it. And he goes, nope, I already know all this stuff. I don't need to know anything else. And that's the one that really makes me sad. Because it's not just, you know, experience can mislead us sometimes. But it was the fact that the mindset was closed off. You know, the fact that I already know everything and it doesn't matter. That's the scariest person for me. Because if you're there, I, I really think it's time to, to retire. Because I've met people that are in their 90s, 95 years old doing HVAC that will still tell you they're learning every day. Yeah. You know, and that's the key. We have If you're not growing then you're it's dangerous so i have like ongoing my 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 desktop looks like a trash can like there's so much stuff on my computer desktop because i'm constantly working on stuff so like for instance so i was working on an intro to co2 class i made a regular co2 class which is more for advanced stuff explaining like some of the flexible combiners and some of the more advanced programming and getting into the set points of the controllers you know the the down and dirty what the the higher level technicians are going to need so I, you know, after that class, so I was like, well, shit, now I need an intro to CO2 class to teach to the lower level guys because we're going to start seeing it residential. So out, uh, just so everyone's aware, right now, I think out in Europe, I think there's 47,000 
uh, CO2 systems that are like rack systems, you know, and then you have um, a bunch of single condensing units that are also CO2 um, that are a bunch. I think Canada has like 1500 and I think we're up to by 2024. I think we're supposed to have about 25, 2500. Um, and just to put it in perspective, I know, you know, Canada's obviously been doing it longer, but remember the population of Canada is basically the population of California. So <laughs> just to put it in, in, in perspective, like, you know, how, you know, how much, how many, how many, how many people there are in Europe versus Canada and, and, and what we're doing and just trying to keep up on all the new technologies. But as I'm making trainings, I'll be reading something and I have all the trainings there at the bottom and I'm like, wow, I know that I'm working on the intro to CO2 class, but this would be really good for this pump liquid CO2 class I'm doing. And then I'm doing this. I'm like, that's why I feel like I never get anything done because I constantly am working on 20 different things at a time just because I'm like, oh, well, that would be good to have here. And if I don't do it right now, I'm going to forget. So just stop what I'm doing, do that, and then move over to that. And then I get distracted again and I get distracted again. Like I have a list of probably 40 different things that I'm working on. And if when it comes down to a deadline, I'll get it done. But, you know, just then that's when the that's when the rush goes on it to finish it up because you make it. I, this was one thing that I struggled with when I started making curriculum. I thought I wasn't doing good enough. So, for example, like I started with a presentation and I had within about two days, I had 40 slides. And then probably uh, I called the guy and I was like, man, how long does this usually take you? He's like, you I mean, you could take months on, on, on a training, like depending on like. If it's all original writing, are you copy and pasting? Like, what are you doing? I'm like, a little bit of everything, you know? And he's like, you know, I'm out, you know, you, I saw, I showed you some of the stuff that I do do is, you know, where I do a lot of call outs on stuff where, you know, we'll tell you exactly what the pressure and temperature should be based off that. Cause that's how I teach, right? So when I teach rack systems, I walk them through first what's called the PNID diagram, right? That's just basically a piping diagram on paper of that piece of equipment because if you walk up to some of these pieces of equipment there are so many pipes trying to trace that is really really difficult so if you know the theory and walk it through exactly you know how it rolls and then back that up with the theory and then we go to the unit it's so much easier to comprehend that and then when we do go back to the unit now i have the pnid diagram that has all these little call outs with it oh well this should be within X to X pressure. Well, that's where we're at. Oh, we should have about three degrees of subcooling here. That's what we have. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I always usually work on all the stuff that's kind of haywire. So, as long as I can get it back to the way it was engineered, if it's still not working at that point, then I know I did everything in my power to get that thing rolling, right? So, it's so something as simple as, as residential HVAC, right? And I, I don't mean to minimize that at all, but it, in comparison to controls on racks and stuff, that's all I'm saying. But like you have, what, you have 20, 20 to 35 degree of uh, uh, condenser TD, right? So whatever the ambient is, you're going to be 20 to 35 degrees, depending on the sear, right? And depending on the efficiency of the unit, would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, typically what, 10 to 15 degrees of subcooling, depending on the time of year, when whenever you're running it, you know, so if you have these rules of thumb you know or, or you know specifically you should go to the, back to the manufacturer exactly what they want but if you have a rule of thumb that that works well um where you know you don't have to pull the whole charge and weigh it back in you can do it based off of oh well i have incredibly high, i got 30 degrees of subcooling and my suction pressure is on the toilet well that sounds like a restriction to me right so like i teach everything by the numbers and it seems to help you know and and as we're going through the numbers i'm also giving them tidbits of information that's going to help them work on that particular piece of equipment because as you know there's there's little idiosyncrasies with a whole bunch of the different stuff that we work on right <clears throat> yeah there, there's so much information out there we all have the the rules of some some basic basic things that work most of the time but what i get worried about is people rely solely on those like they start looking at only pressures and then without looking at super you don't know what's happening to the compressor or, you know, they look at a sight glass. Well, as long as the sight glass is full, no, there's, you know, so much more that goes into that. So we'll look for a shortcut and then someone to make a shortcut of that and someone to make a shortcut of that. And then you end up in, in no man's land and then, the, you know, it gets dangerous. But understanding how that system works, understanding the whole big picture, then if you're looking at some of your shortcuts thinking, hey, well, normally I see this, that's not working right. Then you can go to that next level. Understand, let me look at another number to compare it. Let me look at this, this little bigger side. And that's what's awesome about about the learning and the growing. And even a residential now is getting used to it. Be it was refrigeration is complex. 
Well, now with variable refrigerant flow and very refrigerant volume, uh, refrigeration, air conditioning is getting quite complex. The new units were winning more airflow and understanding duct systems. I mean, it's a whole different world. Some of the stuff that I used to do back in the day that worked, you know, I learned now that, man, I don't know how it worked because my airflow was in the toilet and I did the best airflow in town. But it was still, you know, it was it was less wrong. But now I learned from Ed Genowick, you know, about airflow and he's and he still blows my mind with the same text I've read. He can just explain it in another way that gets me interested in it. And then I, I learn more. You know, there's so many amazing people like uh, Stephen Rogers. He, he's a you know, he knows the physics of stuff and he goes through and is able to explain stuff. Uh, Allison Dale's a physicist about, you know, the building science. And then you get to look and think, hey, this refrigeration components are nothing if we don't solve the issue with the home. And it's it's so cool. And then refrigeration side, you, know, you get somebody that looks at just the, the chest or just the freezer. But then when you step back and look at the building itself, because that's important. Hey, there's condensation in this door. Let maybe it's not a problem with refrigeration. Maybe it's a problem in the in the building. What's our humidity in the building? You know, and you start looking at these bigger pictures or where are we dumping the heat into? You know, what else is going on? And it's it's awesome when you unlock that next level. Now it can be overwhelming. I still get overwhelmed from time to time, but it's great when you get to see that next step and you unlock that next level and you keep taking those steps forward. Well, like like the guy that taught me, like he always said, "Kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Don't overcomplicate it." You know, it's it's still a, a ABC air before charge. You start there, make sure your air is right, and then I have this little nifty triangle that I created. Um, basically, you know, this triangle represents any kind of refrigerated case or any kind of uh, you know air handler unit. Um, we have three things that are going to make that up to make that right: airflow, saturated suction, and superheat. So if the airflow is straight. And the SST is straight. The only other thing that could be messed up on that whole thing is superheat. Whether it's infiltration, that's something that's going to add heat to it. So a leak in the duct work. So it's all relative. You you know you can use utilize that for just about anything that you work on. Um, you know, but like you said, you know, trying to you know teach some of those those right things to do um, and make them stick is, is what what you need to do. So example, and make so. Them stick. Yeah, exactly. So we, uh, we, I had this unit that uh, we kept taking out compressors. Uh, one of the first things I checked, I'm like, all right, let's make sure everything's everything's right, right? So we we checked the airflow and metal duct probably, I don't know, it's probably four feet by about four feet, four feet by four feet or five, I don't know, it was a big duct and it was metal and it was pregnant. It was actually, it was like inflated and it was in the air along the seams. I saw metal foil tape over every single seam i'm like why is every single seam leaking so i go up there's a vfd booster that they put on there just to get some additional uh pressure out in this one facility uh because it's a it's a fresh air unit okay so it takes straight air from outside dehumidifies it or pre-cools it first runs it through a desiccant wheel which brings the dew point down to negative 88 and then runs it through a reheat and that gets a, a dew point i think the set point is 16 degree dew point so it's dry it's making all kinds of they do a whole bunch of production with like uh, different uh cbd powders and stuff so it has to be really dry otherwise the stuff clumps together so i had the guy go up there on the on the on the lift with my manometer and the drill and he's drilling it out and he drills the first hole and he gets shot with a whole bunch of shavings and air and he's like i drilled the hole after the vfd and i didn't get anything i'm like what so we stick the manometer in there. We have four inches across this this VFD, you know, uh, centrifugal blower that's in there. I'm like, turn off the VFD just for shits and giggles. So he turns it off. It goes down to zero. And I'm like, how long has this thing been installed? Oh, about four years. I was like, uh, hit the reverse button and see what happens. So it spun. And then all of a sudden the, the duct like deflated. Then it because it basically you had 10,000 CFM blowing over this way from the unit itself, and then you had a 10,000 CFM blowing, and it was just a power a power match, just trying to figure out who's going to win. And so he starts it up, and he, he looks at me. He's like, um, "How long do you think that's going to run for?" I was like, "You could get a day, you could get a week, you could get a month, you can get a couple of years." My my guess is, I, I bet you probably get less than a month. Two days later, I get a phone call. Man, that thing sounds like shit. I had to shut it down. I was like, well, sound like you need a new one. So that's one thing. Just checking the air before you do anything, whether it be refrigeration, you know, you're checking for the integrity of the coil. You're checking to make sure that there, there's no uh, fins bent over, you know, just going basic before you go all mad scientist. You know, one of the guys I mentored for a while there, he would like come up with these fantastic ideas of what he thought was wrong. But I'm like, did you check this? And he's like, shit. And then he calls me back. He's like, 
yeah, it was just that. Like he was trying to think of some Mr. Wizard crazy, you know, crazy, uh, you know, find. And it, it was just like I said, I tried to instill in him, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Don't overcomplicate it. Go from the basic things. My great grandfather taught me an important rule. Um, if you know what something is made up of, what it's supposed to do and what it's not doing, you can fix just about anything. Doesn't matter if it's a car, doesn't matter. It, as long as you know what parts make it up, what it's supposed to do and what it's not doing, um, you can figure out anything. So one of the things that I tell all my apprentices that I talk to, even if it's one thing a week, find one thing on that piece of equipment, um, that rack or whatever you're working on, and just look at it and look up all the information on it. Because one time at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to be like, man, I really wish I would have did that instead of looking at Facebook all night or Instagram, Jen. So... So it was funny, but there's so many good points you made there, as, as always. I had somebody talking the other day, and I'm like, you have an airflow problem. He goes, yeah, but it's refrigeration. I'm like, yeah, but you still have an airflow problem. I said, send me a picture of that evaporator. He goes, I'll have to move the boxes to get to it. I'm like, well, there, it's an airflow issue, obviously, then. Yeah. Uh, there's been several people talking about, uh, you know, great people in this, on the screen. And I, I, I know that you're a great person, Brent. I always enjoy talking to you. But what's the most important is that everybody here – is great people because you're learning you're wanting to, to see more and more important than that you're going to be helping somebody else whether it's a classroom or you have one person right there that you're going to be able to share this information with and help them have a better life you're the great person all, all these people here wanting to learn that's a difference for me when i the more that i learn the more i realize i don't know and the more i need to learn and so i'm i'm honored to have the friends that i have and the people that i know but there are so many awesome people here in the chat and people that even aren't chatting that's just watching I mean, it's awesome to have people here wanting to learn more stuff. And uh, like Mike Mayberry's here. Mike, I, mean, I, I love watching his stuff. Um, uh, Jimmy, uh, HVAC teacher's here. You know, he's always doing great stuff. But Jimmy, I hope you're feeling better. You know, Jennifer's out there. I mean, there's so many great content creators, great people, people I haven't met before that's here wanting to learn more stuff, wanting to, to get more information. And that is great. I know there's a lot of sales in HVAC now, but that's one thing I love about refrigeration is you have to fix it. You come at, you know, on the weekend and you got a, a box of losing all this food and product. That's, it's like, oh, well, let's get you a price, a new unit. No, it's like, we need it fixed now. now. Like you, you're, you're running out of time. It has to be fixed and you have to do outside of the box magician stuff to make some of this stuff work, at least temporary to solve the real problem. And that's uh, and that same thing is still available on residential side. It's still there being able to help people. But now as there's a lot more private equity companies growing in, which isn't always a bad thing. That's where a lot of people are really realizing they learn. They're really loving commercial. They get to actually go and fix things, understand things. And somebody said earlier that it was really hard sometimes. And yeah, it's hard sometimes. But it's also it's great when you conquer it and you're able to overcome it. You know, you're there and you're sweating and you're frustrated and you're you're saying words you shouldn't say. And then you you figure it out. And then you feel like a million bucks. There's sweat in your eyes. Your eyes are burning. Your tools are hurting. Your knees are giving out. And you're like, yeah, I figured that out. <laughs> and you feel like a million bucks. And then the customer is like. Hey, thanks for getting that going. I used to have a chef that um, there in, in Miami is on the Briscoe something key. Anyways, he would always have he'd always cook me some fancy meal when I come in because I would solve his problem. It's not that I was any better than any other person coming in there. It's that mm -hmm. I would listen to him and then I would just try because some of the stuff is so over my head. I just had to figure it out, you know, just had to work way through it and just and, and I learned so much from being in those uncomfortable situations. Well, you know, I, I spend a lot of time when I'm diagnosing issues, I just spend a lot of time just looking at stuff because sometimes looking at stuff, um, that's why I'm down for like clean machines. Like, you know, if you have the chance, clean off the compressor, it's going to help you find leaks better. You know, the longevity of the compressor because then it's not losing oil. So it has full lubrication, just all that stuff. Right. So prime example, this kid that I had mentored for a while, you know, he was working on a system. He was getting his butt kicked. And he didn't want to bother me yet, so he called someone else. And then he called someone else. And then he called someone else. And then finally Friday, he, you know, he's like, Brett, I, I really need you to come out here. I'm like, okay. So I, I go in with a you know meter, pocket screwdriver, reefer wrench, you know, bare, bare minimum, because I'm just there to observe and look. And so it was a hot gas system that wasn't defrosting. Well, if everyone doesn't know, there are different solenoids that do different purposes, like in Sporlin. So if you see something that says ME, you know, me 19 that's a manually opened e-body 19 port uh, you know solenoid sometimes you will see um uh, cv uh which stands for check valve that is a bi-flow solenoid 
So in all my years of doing this, I've never, ever, ever seen a uh, supply house stock the guts for a internal uh, for an internal check solenoid. I always had to order them, right? Well, the technician that was there, original call was it wasn't feeding refrigerant. Solenoid was backing up. He replaced the solenoid. And I'm just looking around and I see, wow, that solenoid looks brand new. And I'm like, I've never had one on my truck because they always have to order them. I said, chances are, because it, when it goes into hot gas, it goes reverse flow. So the hot gas gets dumped in the suction, comes back up through the liquid line solenoid backwards, and then you know back up to the liquid header. So as I'm staring at this thing, uh, I realize that it's nice and clean. And I'm like, I bet you any money the dude like put in a regular standard guts on that exp- on that solenoid, and it's probably that's why it's not feeding. So I send the kid downstairs, and I was like, hey, listen, put this on the suction line. Tell me if it gets hot. It's not going to work. It hasn't worked in days. I told you. I, I've had this problem. I'm like, just appease me. Just go down and put it on there. So when he went down there, I manual, manual the stem in to force it, you know, to force the refrigerant flow. And, uh, yeah, um, it, it worked. And I all I did was text him. I'm like, 38 seconds. I was like, I, I, you know, he's like, what the hell is that supposed to mean? I was like, just come on up here. I just want to show you what I found. He's like, what the hell? I've been here. I was like, it solenoid rebuilt wrong and he's like you're you're an ass you're an ass thank you but you're an ass so i mean you know those little things you know you're because you're looking around you know you're playing sesame street one of these things is not like the other look for oddities look for stuff that does that you know doesn't make sense one of the things we should do as technicians and a lot of people don't do this on a perfectly working system Okay, I'm not talking about a critically charged system. I'm just talking about, a, you know, whether it be a residential split unit, rooftop unit. Let's put some gauges on it and just measure some shit. Measure what the subcooling is. Measure what the superheat is. Because here's the thing. You're only fixing it when there's something wrong, right? But then you're like, well, I don't, I don't know what it's supposed to be when it's, when it's working right. So, like, that's what I did. It was like, well, I'm just doing a PM. Let's scope. I mean, I know this thing's working good. I just tweaked everything. Let's see what the numbers are. All right, well, off a, a rack or a split condenser uh, unit or, uh, you know, uh, whatever. I'm going to get a, typically about a self-contained system. I'm going to get about five degrees of subcoin. I now know that, you know. I also know that they have a 20-degree TD. So now from here on out, I can use that for a rule of thumb if I can't get the manufacturer spec. Because sometimes getting a hold of the manufacturer is a difficult approach. So if you spend the time while you're doing the PM, it isn't just to, to, to pencil with it and be like, oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Start taking some freaking measurements because then I know for, for, for here on out, oh, well, that train Voyager 89675329 Jenny, you know, it, it's supposed to be at, you know, uh, you know, five degrees of subcooling coming out, coming out of the condenser. Well, now I know that forever. So I can tell whether the thing is actually doing everything it can. Um, oh, well, I typically get about, you know, on a, on, you know, I usually get about 20, 23 degrees of superheat, you know, we're maintaining, uh, uh, you know, a, a 38 degree saturated suction coil and we have, you know, 62 degrees coming back, you know, just figuring out what it's supposed to be running while it's actually running good. Cause then you have those numbers for backup for when it, you know, for when it's, when it's not messed, when it's messed up. And that's the big thing. Just get started getting some numbers, getting from, I hate it when somebody calls me and they're like, yeah, this thing's not working and, and I've checked everything and nothing's working. So, well, what have you checked? Everything. <laughs> well, this conversation is going to be really short because I got a lot to do. I need some information. Give me the numbers you do know, and then we'll go from there. And then they'll start giving me information. And, you know, most of the time when I do tech support and I, I do not like doing tech support, but uh, which one find- does the blue hose go on and which one does the red one go on? <laughs> I, uh, speaking of reefer work, anyways, I, uh, I have learned that a lot of times when you just ask people to get the information, they'll find the answer themselves. Like they'll start responding. Hey, did you find, oh yeah, I figured it out. You know, what was it? Oh yeah, no, I figured it out. That's how I know it's probably something easy, but by forcing them to go get this information that they found, they found the answer. So yeah, starting getting as much information as you can start looking at stuff, seeing what it is. And by the time you fill out a list, Copeland has a really cool, um, checklist that they give people and i have my own many people have one but it's just really hey start getting this information and you may not even need that number that's on there but by getting that information have you look at stuff by you're looking at the air coming out of the coil the condition of the coil the temperature of the air coming out of the coil the saturated temperature the superheat the sub you know all this stuff you're getting that information and that's huge just start seeing it and getting it and get that information while systems running correctly don't wait until you have a problem when you're doing working on anything else, check all as much stuff as you can. That way you have that idea in your mind of what 
normal is. It's, you know, most of the time it's just a setting on a washing machine, but you get an idea of what's happening most of the time. That's a good analogy. <laughs> No, uh, it's I, I totally agree, and and like you know, I'm going to tell a story. I'm sorry about the stories, but like you know, one of the first times, don't be afraid to mess up either. So one of the first times I'm working with Ed, you know, he he's like, yo, go go on your, uh, you know, go on your own, see if you can figure out. It's a big, you know, the green carrier weather makers, but this was like a five five burner, you know, individual big freaking probably a twenty ton unit or something, and he's like, go figure out what's wrong, kid. I'm like, okay, so I come back to him real proud, and I'm like. All five ignition modules are bad. And he goes like this. He's like, Brett, right now you need to make a conscious decision. Do you want to be a technician or do you want to be a parts changer? I was like, How? I want to be a technician. He's like, go figure out what the hell's wrong. And it, obviously, now from here on out, I always look for commonality, right? So you look for common problems. So I had five um, ignition modules that I thought were bad. Balance of probability suggests it's probably a common issue because if I have five bad ignition modules, I'm just going to go play the lottery and win a billion dollars because that's probably going to be, the you know, I'm probably going to do that if I was actually right. Obviously, I come back and I'm like, the belt was loose, the limit was tripped, and that's, I only need one ignition module, everything else lit off, you know? <laughs> but that's what I mean. Like, like, he's just like, you need not to just, you know, you, Actual diagnose it. One of the things that I don't like that that people that have been in the trades for a while is they do this diagnostic based off of past experiences. I'm not saying don't use the past experiences, but you can't solely rely on it. Oh, well, that superheat's really high. It's probably just low on charge. Can't do that. You know, you need all the numbers. Also, as an apprentice, don't lie to the guy that's trying to help you. If he asks you for a voltage and you're like, yeah, it's 120 volts. I'm like, no, really? What is it? No, it's 120 volts. I'm like, no, no, really? What is it? Well, it's, it's 110. Okay. That's what I want to know. Because if you're lying to me and, and sorry to curse again, but you give me shit information, you're going to get a shit diagnostic from me. And that's just the way it is. You lie to me. I, I, I can't help you. You know, uh, a lot of times, like you said, a lot of times when people are just asking you questions, it's infuriating to them when they do ask me questions because usually I retort with another question and it's to get them to think where I think that they need to go. Um, you know, we were talking about compressors the one day and he, uh, he's like, it, it, yeah, the liquid injection is flooding back. I was like, I don't think that that's liquid injection. I think it's vapor injection. No, no, it's, it's, it's feeding liquid. I was like, what's the model number on the compressor? It's a KV. Shit. I'll, I'll call you back. And it was the subcooler flooding back the compressor through the economizer port through the vapor injection. But sometimes that's all it takes is just asking a question to make sure they looked at that instead of just, oh, it's liquid. It looks like it's liquid. It's sticking like it's liquid. Do the investigation, you know. And when I say that, it's not just us on this side giving information. It's us being on the other side of that. I remember I was working on a unit. This, I mean, I was early in the field and I was it was a Friday night. I was trying to get out of there. And uh, I had this one wire. I could remember I didn't write it down like I was told to do a thousand times. And we didn't have cameras back then in those days. And I couldn't remember which, where this wire went. I didn't want to burn anything out. And uh, I called up this guy. I can't remember his name. He's such a brilliant man. And I was like, hey, I need to know where this wire goes. He goes, yeah. I, do you have the panel? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, now turn that over. I'm like, okay. He goes, now look down about in the middle of that panel. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. He goes, do you see all those lines in there? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He goes, okay. One of those is going to be your answer. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I was mad. Like I was fit to be tied. If there was a, if my boss was around, I would have been fired at that moment. I went outside of the truck and I was, I was, I was a hothead back in those days. Like, I tell you. And uh, then I calmed down, went back in, and it forced me to read that schematic. And uh, and that was the best lesson he could have ever taught me because then I learned that I had to read the schematics. Yeah, and that well, you know, electrical is one of those the one of those things I think is is one of the harder things. The theory is not, you know, horribly difficult at points to, 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 to understand. Um, I, I think electrical is, is very difficult. I, I was fortunate. So actually when I, when I got out of high school, um, I was uh, homeless at the time and, and living in my car and I ended up going to uh, a school where I got a degree in electronical engineering. So that's actually, I did, wasn't even going to this field. I was doing electronics. So I went and, uh, 
uh, you know, ended up doing cell phone remanufacturing and a whole bunch of, you know, uh, graphic dimming panels for stadiums and stuff. And I ended up getting this on a whim because I got laid off from a place and they did water treatment for industrial cooling towers and boilers. So like, I just kept learning everything I could and just kept stepping up, you know, going from water treatment and then I was doing residential and then I worked my way up to commercial and then I worked my way up to industrial air compressors and that in turned into industrial refrigeration. And then when I moved to Connecticut, I worked for a commercial outfit and I, I helped start their energy management department. And then after that, I came down here. I just, you know, kept evolving and, and just and learning more and more because there's so much to learn in this field. Um, I am. It's not set in stone yet, but I'm supposed to learn a, bu a bunch about uh, building sciences and pressurization and ductwork and a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm going to be working with some of our friends on some other podcast that I'll mention later after I get the okay. Um, but I told him, I was like, let's do an air for dummies and I'll be the dummy. And then just you guys teach me because like, I, I, I like I've done like small ductwork sizing for like my house, but I've never done it. Like, you know, like so these guys do. And I, I, I want to learn because I, I have to be able to teach it and find out what things my guys don't, don't know. And so you're constantly evolving. You're constantly just learning new things. And, and I sure as hell don't know everything. Um, I would love to, uh, you know, I, you know, right, right now, the building science side is where my heart's at. Like I, I'm, I, I'm loving the teaching. That's, that's what I'm called to do. And, you know, I still love refrigeration, all the new components in it, but the building science side of things that just has my interest right now. And I've just been reading and I, I struggle to read, but I've been reading so much about it, reading articles, reading the books about it trying different things out, like doing experiments in the house right now and, you know, seeing how the cause and effect of stuff, really mm -hmm. thinking about things, reading through some of the other groups. Like I'm, I'm afraid to say anything in these groups because there's brilliant minds, you know, but I'm reading as much as I can, reading the conversations and some of the things that they like talk about are such fine details. And I'm like, you know, does that even matter? But it, it does. So I'm, I'm reading all these conversations and people, you know, kind of going back and forth over these little details. And it's, oh man, it's fascinating to me, all little things because it's air all around us and it's invisible but it's so important yeah I, I i my building sciences is 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 lacking uh exponentially that's why i i had mentioned i was like let's do a dummy series and i'll be the dummy and then you guys can just teach me everything you guys know about this and um you know because i figured it'd be a two-part i mean there's always someone else that, that needs to learn i will give a, a recommendation you know because I, I actually i struggle with reading um and people laugh when i say that because they're like you remember everything. I was like, I, but I, I have to fight for it. So what I've learned to do is, uh, you know, I, I'm sure if you're having the same problem I do, I jump around a lot. So I actually started using an index card when I read. Um, this is a joke, but this is an example of something that really happened. Um, we're reading to my kids at night. I'll be reading a story about, you know, Dick and Jane riding an elephant and then going to eat lunch. If I don't use the index card, Dick and Jane somehow eat the elephant. Now my kids can't freaking sleep. And now I'm an asshole for scaring them. So they can't sleep. So now I use index card and then that way I can read fully through and then I don't jump around the pages. Um, it just, it makes it easier. And I know a lot of mechanics are, are visual and auditory learners and usually have a, 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 a lacking comprehension. Um, using that index card, you know, uh, it will help you out exponentially. It has me, it, it, you know, cause you're not focusing on this pretty picture that's over there. You're not focusing on these words over here, the, the italicized word, the bold word over here. You're basically just going through line item by line item and, and making sure that you're grasping everything that's being said. And it, it's, it's helped me because otherwise it's audio books. Like I, you know, I, I felt left out cause everyone's like, Oh, read Brian Orr's new book, read Brian Orr's new book. I'm like, I'm going to wait for audio. Because otherwise, I'll be there forever. I'm like, what did you just say? I, you know, and just have to go back. I 100% I agree with the note card. I've been using that for quite a while. And uh, and highlighters for me work great. Um, highlighting things in different color. And I also keep a, a notepad with me. And if I find myself struggling or my mind drifting off, I'll just start re rewriting sentences until I, I'm forced to focus back into it. And writing is actually a really powerful learning tool. Like if you write something down, it's 10 times more powerful than any other way of information. But just by writing it, because it makes your brain think about it, slow down, process it. And then you have to use mechanical motion to put it back in. And one of the things I used to do in school was I'd made my students, we would, they'd have to rewrite the question and the correct answer. And I would give them the correct answer. But I wanted them wording that in 
So that way they knew, hey, here's how you find super heat. And they would actually have to write that down three times. That was a punishment because, hey, I wanted to learn the information. I didn't care if they missed only one question. I wanted the students writing it so they knew the information. You could miss every single question on my test. You had to rewrite every one three times each. But the second time, the students would be like, I remember that. And they were so proud that they learned it, remembered it. It's like, yeah, I'm not making you rewrite it because I'm no jerk. I'm doing it because I know it works. It works for me and it works for the people. And you could literally fail every question on a test and you could still pass my class because I wanted the effort. I wanted mm -hmm. to see, you know, are you putting the effort in? Are you willing to learn this? I don't care if it takes you twice as long, three times as long, because it takes me five times as long. But if you're willing to put that effort in and learn it, then I will get you there. So all of our all of our tests are are multiple choice for for cool assist, except for some of the construction stuff. But I think we're changing that around to to make it a little bit more palatable. And uh, one of the things when we study for the test, I will give you a question. In a like it won't be an A B C D question. I'm going to make sure you understand the theory, because what I don't want from you is just to remember the answer. Oh well. That was that was B because it was this. You know what I mean? Yes. No, you're going to understand the actual theory on behind that. I might take 10 minutes to to explain that theory, but at least you won't be memorizing the answer. You'll remember remember the theory, which is going to help you in the future. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So I've used enough of myself essentially writing new. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have to draw it out, JD. How you doing, JD? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I love your drawing, JD, because I, I try to write stuff out and, and I draw stuff and I have I don't have that talent. I have it in my mind, but I can't get it. And I can scribble some horrible stuff on paper and send it to JD. And he's like, oh, yeah. In like two minutes, he was like, hey, does this work for you? I'm like, how do you do that? But, you know, he's, he's not only he's doing it to help himself, but he's helping so many other people and he's helping me out. He's able to, I'm able to use those drawings of other people. I mean, that's that's super awesome when you get somebody that uh, found a way that they can learn and they're using that to help other people. Man, that's that's what it's all about right there. So I just found out this uh, last year that my daughter has dysgraphia. OK, and I don't know if anyone knows what that is. It's nope. uh, dysgraphia. Basically, you see what's there and then you try to write it down and it looks nothing like it. So I just thought for my whole life, I've just had sloppy ass handwriting. I look like I'm a freaking doctor. No, it, I have. I, apparently, I have dysgraphia where, you know, I can't do that. I can't take what's up here and put it put it down on pen, even words, it just looks, it looks like chicken scratch. It's absolutely awful. Like sometimes I even go through, I have pages and pages of stuff. Like one time I was motivated. I'm like, I'm going to write a book. So I just started writing all these chapters and I'm like, what the hell was I trying to say? And then I'm trying to make out what I did. I was like, oh, that's what I was trying to explain. <laughs> so like, that's why a lot of times, um, and anyone that talks to me via text or, or DM or whatever, there's usually spelling, it's riddled with spelling issues because I text to talk insanely a lot and they're like what are you trying to say and there's certain people so my co-host kevin he knows exactly what i'm saying when i send it same thing with jennifer like if i if i send her a text and and, and it might not make any sense whatsoever but she's like oh yeah i got i got understand and it's just and, and i'm sure the same thing with you chris uh, you know i talked to uh, you know bill and adam a bunch <laughs> and they've just gotten used to it. they're like oh yeah that's what he's trying to say <laughs> I'll, I'll misspell my own name <laughs> People say, oh, you must be using text to speech. I'm like, well, that one I actually typed out. But yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, an HVAC owners and business group, which I had to leave because I just couldn't stand the people that were on there. And one guy's like, yeah, I look for spelling errors on a resume to see if somebody's going to be a good tech. I'm like, you're an idiot. That'd be like me seeing if a, if a, if a H, if somebody teaching English can braise. Like, well, if you can braise, you can teach English. I'm like, that is, they're not connected in any way. I'm like, no wonder we have a problem with the HVAC industry when people that are having businesses think like that. I'm like, that was the most backwards thing ever. If you judged me and my ability to spell, I wouldn't have a job doing anything. Like, I would be, I'd be just kicking rocks. Well, that's one thing that I that I've taken up since I've been in this position. I've tried to be a, a you know a, an advocate for technicians. So if we're you know doing policy, you know, I try to give my two cents of how you know how the technicians are going to feel about you know certain things because I you know. I think now I've been in the field. Oh my God, I'm getting old. 20, 21 years. I think I've been doing this. So, and I, I count my electronics in that, but so yeah, 21 years I've been doing this stuff. And I, like I said, I've worked on anything from a mini split to a thousand horsepower ammonia screw, you know, and, and it's not flexing. It's just, it gives you, you know, it, that's why I think I have a, a good approach at a lot of things because I've seen, 
you know, HVAC used for process cooling. I've seen, you know, chillers used for comfort, but I also have seen chillers used for process. You know what I mean? So getting all these different things, because refrigeration is refrigeration. I don't care if it's HVAC, comfort cooling, doesn't matter. It's still using the same processes um, to do the same damn thing. It's just a different engineering specs and different control. I mean, it's, it's, and people cringe when I say that, like, you know, they're like, no, no, it's totally different. The only thing different that I've ever noticed as far as like refrigeration and HVAC are is you can tell uh, a mechanic uh, what he works on based off of answers that he gives you. So if I ask an HVAC guy, you know, what 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 you know, what are you supposed to be running on a 410 system? Well, about a 100 degree day, you're going to get about 120 to 130, 30 PSI on the highest on the low side. And you get about, you know, 440, 460 on the high side. If you talk to a, a, a reefer tech, they're going to be like, oh, you should be running 38 degrees saturated for your suction and you should be running, you know, 20 or 35 degrees above ambient for your for your high side. You know, that's what you're going to get. Why? Because HVAC up until a couple of years ago, they had what two refrigerants we were worried about. We were worried about 22 and 410. Now I know there's a whole bunch of different drop ins and stuff, but because refrigeration mechanics work on a magnitude of different refrigerants. It's easier just to say, okay, it's this saturated. I don't care what gases it is in it. If I know what the saturated is supposed to be, I'll tell you what the pressures are. You just got to use the damn PT chart. Right. So here's a, a really great comment right here. Uh, 21 years himself, not sure if he wants to move into the educator role. I commend you guys for your patience. I, I tell you, um, it does take a lot of patience. I mean, it, it, it does take a lot of patience because something comes easy to us. That we've done a thousand times they've never done it before they've never seen it in person and they take a concept and, and you do have to have patience but what makes it worth it is when you have the patience you explain something the 20th time you know they're still not getting it that 21st or maybe it's the 101st time when they get it and they get that that you can see the light go up in their eyes you can tell that they get they don't have to tell you anything you know when they get it and and They'll try to hide it or whatever, but you know when they get it, that's a huge feeling. And then when they come to you later and be like, I've never understood that. My whole life I've wanted to understand it. And I finally get that. Or I can actually, I learned how to read now because of these little tricks you taught me. Or I can figure these things out. Or then later, like, I got a job that I enjoy doing. I don't hate my work anymore. Or, you know, they get their first raise. They get a company vehicle. They've never had that. Or they call you back 10 years later, be like, yeah, you know what? I'm starting my own company now. Those things right there, nothing else will pay like that does. Um, nothing else. I mean, teaching pays horrible on my side, but it uh, nothing nothing fits like that. And so, you learn to have the patience because you want to. Your heart is to help people. I know in the field sometimes it's stressful. You got to get the job done. You got to get the system back up and running. And sometimes you don't have the time to baby somebody through all the steps. I don't mean baby. I just mean it's the time to really care somebody through it. And you have to get the job done. And I, I get that. But whenever possible, having the time to go back, like, look, man, I was short with you today. When, you know, we had this job to get done. I was super stressed. Uh, you know, I, I don't want you to take that personally. Let's talk on the way home. Let's talk about what happened. And let's talk. I'll, I'll try to teach you as much as what happened in there. And uh, and that's OK. And but you learn that really it's the people that we work with that really make life so important. And there's been people I worked with that I just could not stand. And now we are like really close friends you really get to see that it's okay to be different. It's okay to have people that have different, entirely different things. Some of the, the students I've had, uh, you know, were opposite ends of, of the voting spectrum. And I would not allow anybody to talk about politics. When I'm at work, when I'm teaching, we don't talk politics, we don't talk, we don't talk sports, and we don't talk religion. And yet, yep. I have all of those, the same views, but I do not talk with those if I'm working or teaching. And I don't let anybody else either because it can turn into such fights. I got friends that are in prison. I got friends that are in the police force. I got friends uh, that are atheists. I got friends that are evangelicals. I got friends that are all different. I think just about every kind of religion out there. And we all get along because it's what we have in common. So when you're teaching and you're having to be patient, it's about, hey, you want to help this person. And sometimes you get short with them and like you just circle back around. But hey, look, you know what? I wasn't myself. I apologize. Let's get to the root of what's going on. And and that's how you do it. And then each time you do it, you think, hey, I can help somebody else. So the fact that you may not be good at it now or have patience now, it's still if I can do it, I, I know other people can do it. Well, you know, one of the one of the other things. So uh, when teaching people, I think it makes you, you know, yeah, you have to have the patience, but it actually makes you a better technician because you're constantly, 
constantly trying to reference material that's up here and trying to, you know, trying to curtail it in a way that they don't get it. You know, um, you know, it's, uh, I use, I use jokes a lot, you know, in order to, you know, convey what, what I'm talking about. And, uh, sometimes it's just, if they, you don't get, you, you have to be able to explain it one way. And if they don't get it that way, you just got to figure out, okay, well, if I change this a little way, it's, you know, just the analogy that I'm giving, it might make more sense, like, you know, water and, and electricity, right. Using those two in, 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 in correlation in order to, you know, explain Ohm's law and stuff, you know, something as simple as that. But I, I really think it helps you become a better technician. Uh, the kid, like I said, I, I bring his name up again, Greg, uh, you know, he now is me in Dallas. He's taking care of all the issues that I would have taken taken care of. And I told him he was real nervous when he when he when he started doing that stuff. And I was like, listen, you being a team lead and you, you know, being the guy that everyone's going to call, it's going to make you so much of a better technician because, you know, I, I laugh and I joke that, you know, I'm 41. Oh, shit, I'm going to be 41 this year. I'm going to be 41 this year and I have 40 years experience. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense. I was like, overtime. Uh, so, like, I basically have 40 years of knowledge of but only doing this 20 years on top of all the other questions that you're fielding constantly from the field. What's your best advice on an apprentice of making the knowledge and theory stick? Hmm. I, I say it's a uh, repetition. Doing it uh, to get like uh, Brian Orr said in his book. Uh, that reps is learning, doing things over and over. And I found that in the lab. I wouldn't just have a student do something one time. I'd take them out and have them do it until they hated doing it, till they could do it, you know, in their sleep, blindfold if it took. So I think that's a big part of it. And then uh, building my building curiosity, building that curiosity. How can you get them interested in what's happening? How can you lead them to the answer? Um, and then as far as making it stick, I think that's just repetition. That's that's my advice on that. I mean, there's a lot to that. Well, I guess it really depends on, on what, you know, what part of the theory that you're working on, right? So if you're working on electrical, uh, I had a guy that was struggling, uh, you know, we, whenever we pass a level um, to make sure not only that you're book smart, we also want to make sure that you actually can do the stuff out in the field. So every level that we have, there is a field evaluation that has to be done. So if it's a lower level, okay, I need you to reclaim this refrigerant out of here, and then I need you to reclaim it out of here, and then I, you know, just you know, hooking up this vacuum pump, doing the push pull math, whatever, whatever it is. And just, he was struggling with schematics and he just didn't get it. So I went to the part shelf. I was like, grab the defrost, uh, uh, defrost clock, grab two contactors, grab, you know, grab some, uh, some switches, some light switches just to represent high and low pressure switches. I was like, here, here's a schematic can wire it up. I want you to wire it up. And he was just struggling for a little bit. And, you know, he did it over and over again until he got it. And then he's like, Oh my God, I like, after like the third or fourth time, he's like, this totally makes sense now. Like now, now I can actually do it. Ty, I'm just letting you know, I saw lightning and you know how Texas is. So I'm just forewarning. Oh, yeah. I might disappear in a minute. <laughs> uh, one of the things I did in class uh, would do sometimes things dramatic uh, to make it stick, where I would drop something or like whatever it took to get them involved in it. And talking about, you know, shorts and contact or using, make sure you never cross high voltage and low voltage. I would say it like over and over to have the class say it. And then someone's like, well, what happens if we do it? I'm like, oh, it's really not that big of a deal. So I just grabbed the contactor. We plugged it at 120 volts. And um, I say, okay, see that? That's factory smoke coming out of there. And once that comes out, you can't get it back in. And then, poof, it ignites on fire. And everybody jumps back. And, you know, I uh, pull the fire extinguisher out, put the fire out. It's like, and that's why we don't cross high voltage with low voltage. And then I guarantee you that nobody will ever forget that ever again. So, you know, if you have the time and old parts in a, in a safe environment, safety glasses, and, you know, just try doing stuff like that to make them to make it uh, sink in. And we talk about compressors. We talk about low super heat kills the compressor or no oil return. Cut the stuff open. Two reasons. One, you can see why it's failing. But two, you can show them. You can show them copper plating. Hey, why do we have to pull the vacuum down this deep? Hey, let's cut this one open. Let's see what killed it. Oh, look, copper plating. Again, again, copper plating. So they can see it and then they can touch it. They can understand like copper plating is a, a real thing. I mean, I've got one right here. Oh, I should have my safety glasses on here, right? <laughs> Get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> right, copper plating. Yeah. You know, and when people say, oh, well, yeah, I can just do a quick vacuum. But they don't see this is happening. They don't see that this is taking the life of a compressor. These scrolls should be lasting 20 years easy. 
Yeah. We don't pull a good people say, Oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. I never had to pull a good vacuum. Well, yeah, that's copper plate. He didn't show up good in his camera. But uh, yeah, that's why we do it. So if you can show them as much stuff, let them touch it, let them see it, let them smell it. I even had one student that had a, that he liked to lick things. I, I don't know, like maybe he was a Marine. I don't know, but let them lick it. Like, I, you know, like whatever it takes for you to understand and learn to remember it. Like, let's, let's do it. Let's get it. Let's make it happen. We, we had a facility uh, that had copper plating so bad that we had to replace every single four cylinder compressor that was on that rack. Um, basically what happened was it had, there are, there were some minor leaks and, you know, usually on a, on a big system like that, you have a uh, energy management system and it usually fail safes when you have a communication failure. Well, the communication failure happened. So all the compressors ramp, you know, turned on. Well, the only thing that left is going to cut it out is either individual pressure switches or one main master low pressure switch. Well, that master low pressure switch had failed and, you know, automatically set itself to 15 inches of vacuum. So the whole time when the communication failure happened, what happened? All the compressors ran and just runs down. Send us some of the rain. Where are you at? San Angelo, Texas. Oh, oh, it's your wife. I'm sorry. Man. That's my wife. <laughs> 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 it was really but, funny when uh when somebody else got her mail recently the the post office gave it to the wrong box small community we're super small and yeah. they brought it over it's like yeah is this robots like yeah they're alive. the guy was looking like uh <laughs> 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 it was hilarious it was awesome that's great um so. but no um just in case i lose you i, I just want to uh, send off with a hey, we are hiring Cool says is hiring everywhere. We have, like I said, 88 different offices. We're in just about every single state. Uh, if you want to reach out, uh, you know, potentially for a job, you know, we, we have some really good things that are happening in the training department. Like I said, we're working on a whole bunch of different CO2 curriculum, uh, working on the like commercial curriculum, which is going to be up and running for this school year. And when I'm finally ready to talk about it, Ty, we're going to talk about that program that I was telling you about that I'm super stoked about. So I want to share that with everybody when it's time. But as of right now, we're not there yet. We're almost there. I also want to just say, whatever you're doing, be the best at it. If you're pushing a broom, be the best at it. But also be looking for another level. If you're wherever you are in the field right now and you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm just bored with this. I don't feel challenged. Start looking for that next step up. Maybe it's commercial. Maybe it's super park refrigeration. Maybe it's restaurant work. Maybe it's the hot side. I mean, there, maybe it's the building science. There's so much this trade. You can never learn it all. I know Jason Johnson's here, and he moved to a different state and a different uh, part of the career, and he is, he's loving it. He's doing He's rocking it. So I know it can be frustrating where we're at sometimes. Uh, what they say, you need either a change in environment or a change in your mind. So sometimes that change of environment to a different part of the career, and it's refreshing to be able to do more. And sometimes you find out, hey, what I was doing before, I like better. And that's okay, too. Well, I mean, it's it's I, I don't like when I feel that 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 plateau, right, where it doesn't seem like I can really go any further. Right. And that's why I dig what I do, because there's always new technologies. Right. And well, if I'm in charge of training, guess what? I got to teach everyone about this new technology. So guess what? I have to learn it. So, you know, talking with people that, that are, you know, leaders in the industry, manufacturers and, you know, constantly shooting the shit with them and, and ask them about, you know, this situation, and this, you know, it just makes me a better technician, a better trainer, a better teacher. And then I can give that information to everybody because, I mean, that's what it's all about is, you know, making sure that, you know, everyone understands. No one likes not knowing what they're doing and I, and, and, you know, when I when I first started this trade, I told you that, that I was living in my car and, and I, I I didn't own any tools. So I actually went to Home Depot, maxed out a credit card that I my first credit card I ever got two thousand dollars, maxed everything out, got my Ryobi bag set of tools, you know, the power tools and stuff and need all the sheet metal cutters and everything I would ever need, my husky wrenches and stuff. And within three weeks, the guy that I worked for told me I was the biggest piece of crap that he's ever met and I was never going to amount to anything. And I was crushed. I was like, I just went from electronics to this industry and now you're telling me that I suck at it and what am I going to do? Well, screw you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be the best at what I can. And so that's what I've been doing. I'm I, you're trying to get affirmation and, you know, build up and build up the information that I know about that. And once I get decent at that, you know, I'm getting bored now. All right, now it's time to make a change. And that's why if you look at my resume, it's like usually every five years, oh, Brett moved a job. Why? I, don't know, I was bored. You know, I wanted something else to learn. 
and you know, you just keep feeding that need to just know everything you can. So yeah, I I hundred percent agree. I mean, it took me a while before I learned, you know, what uh, what this was on the compressor. It bugged the heck out of me. Now that I know what it was, like that's an important piece. Like we should know what that is. But have that curiosity. Learn. You know, keep finding stuff. And there's so many great people now with the internet. There's so many great people we can get questions from. And I don't know all the answers, but I know people that have them. And I know a lot of times where to find them. And that's that's the key. Just keep learning, keep growing. And if you're looking at getting into uh, the, the commercial side, you know, uh, give cool says, look up Brett and say, uh, hey, what do I got to do? What are the pro- actually what instead of having everybody go to you, what are the proper steps for them to get? Uh, so if you if you go to coolsys.com, there there is a list of job openings, uh, you know, ranging across the country, you know, dispatchers and uh, talent acquisition agents and, and everything like that. So you can actually go and see if we're hiring in the area. If you don't see anything, just, uh, you know, send me an email at bwetzel at coolsys.com. And, you know, maybe I can uh, see what's going on in that area and see, you know, see when they're going to be hiring and, and help you out. That's fantastic. Uh, and then right before we go, one last thing. Some of the senior techs can be uh, a-holes to the apprentices. And I can't change that. But what I can do is have you don't be that way. Have you when you're stressed out? There's been times I wanted to be that jerk, but just take a deep breath. Say, look, I just need you to be quiet for a little bit. I'm struggling with this. Let me work my way through it. And just you be the change. You be that change. And we that's how we change the world. Everybody here doing what they can for the next generation. And Brett, man, it's always a pleasure talking to you. It's fine. It's great to actually do this live, you know, right at this. Other people get to hear what we talk about. I wish you do this again more often. But uh, thank you so much for having us on. Go say hi to your family and uh, and get off before the lightning strikes. <laughs> All right, brother. Hey, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you for everybody for listening. Never stop learning. Absolutely. Thanks, guys.